Okay, uh, we'll get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on uh, which time zone you're in, how light or dark it is outside. Um, I'm Donna Kosak, past president of the Marine Technology Society and fellow at L3 Harris Technologies. Uh, these dialogues are sponsored by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, the Marine Technology Society, MTS, and the Global Ocean Observing System, uh, GOOS. And they're recognized as an Ocean Decade event. We welcome you and sincerely, sincerely appreciate uh, you joining this fourth of four dialogues in, in industry. Uh, it's looking ahead, new technology for the Ocean Decade. Next slide. Uh, these dialogues are being initiated for one fundamental reason. Um, there's an expanding societal need for ocean observings uh, driven by the need to adapt to climate change and move to more sustainable ocean management um, and the new blue economies. In fact, uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has predicted the ocean economy will reach $3 trillion by 2020. And in the end of 2022, the United States Department of Commerce found that the American blue economy contribute about 361 billion of the nation's gross domestic product across 10 sectors representing business to business, businesses, uh, depending on the nation's oceans, coasts, and Great Lakes. We are also seeing a growth in businesses that are either, either producing ocean observing platforms, providing ocean observing as a mission or service, and using ocean information to provide a product for sale. Uh, the NOAA IUS Ocean Enterprise states that the value of the enterprise to be about $8 billion annual revenue with over 814 companies, a significant growth from the same study five years ago. Canada and the United, United Kingdom have conducted similar studies with similar results. This translates to a growing demand for ocean information, as well as a growing pool of partners that can meet this demand. This represents a change from the paradigm, and it's what we're here to talk about today. Next slide. The diagram on the slide combines the ocean information value chain and the segments of the ocean observing enterprise to illustrate the importance of ocean information and related services. Applying the value chain approach to our dialogues allows us to explore how ocean observations are converted through a wide range of interactions, transformations, and service delivery mechanisms into products that have value to decision makers and business leaders. This shows that the partners in the value chain interconnect to deliver information to end users, who in turn derive socioeconomic and economic benefits from the information products. Private and public organizations, as well as public-private partnerships on a local, national, regional, and global level can contribute to any number of these elements. This reinforces that the ocean observing network in the future will be multi-sectoral. Today, we are focused on the left-hand side of the value chain, the observing technology. The first part of our discussion will focus on new technology that will change ocean observing in the next decade. The second part um, will discuss emerging ocean information demands that will require new technology skills and business models. The planning team has tried to craft these dialogues differently. And instead of a single panel or session at many of the ocean forums, uh, which are all very important, we spent quite a bit of time uh, curating four dialogues that will build upon each other. We are looking forward to hearing from you uh, on actionable recommendations, and our moderator will continue to push you in that direction. We also want to ensure a broad representation. You, the participants, represent the public, private, and academic sectors in disciplines ranging from technologists to economics, uh, from lawyers to venture capitalists. So I'm pleased to, uh, to introduce Chris Ostrander. Uh, our, he's our moderator and executive director for MTS. Um, you'll see a short bio on the screen, but it's important to note that Chris began his career in ocean observing. He was the founding director of the Pacific Island Ocean Observing System, or PAC IUS, one of the 11 regional associations of the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System. He also participated on the national stage as a member of the IUS Federal Advisory Committee. So once again, thank you for participating and I look forward to a robust conversation. Take it away, Chris. 
Thanks, Donna. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to join all of you for this fourth and final dialogue in our series. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. For our invited participants, for our panelists, I ask that you keep your video on during the discussion and ask you to use the raise hand feature so I can call on you to share your thoughts with the group. Uh, in some cases, I may direct a question at a particular participant or group of participants. And in the interest of keeping the discussion moving, I may shift to a new question before I've been able to call on everyone who raises their hand. I encourage you to keep the Q&A box on your screen so you can see the comments and questions that come in from our audience. Please respond in the box, layer in your own comments to what has been submitted. You won't be able to initiate your own thread in the Q&A, but you can ask any questions you have for the group by raising your hand. In the interest of time, I'm not going to introduce our invited participants. Instead, please tell folks your name, your role, and your organization when you speak for the first time. For our audience participants, our observers, please listen to the conversation and submit written comments in the Q&A box for everyone to see. You can also layer in feedback to the questions or comments posted by everybody else during our discussion. And during the last 30 minutes of our session, we'll invite everyone in to participate in open conversation. For everyone, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. Our conversation today is divided into two sessions, and we've set aside about 45 minutes for questions and discussion in each session with a short break in between. Please note that this dialogue, the Q&A, and the chat are all being recorded and will be made available in the coming weeks. The content of the session report, though, will not include attribution to the comments or questions of any individual participant. So let's get started. Our first session is focused on new technologies for ocean observing, both those that are reaching maturity now and those on the horizon that have yet to be developed and deployed. Underpinning this discussion is the reality that rapid advances in material science, power generation and storage, onboard processing and data telemetry, autonomy and sensor systems are enabling a renaissance in ocean observing technology. So my first question for the group, what do you see as the most impactful, nascent or emerging technological transformation that will enable the collection of the next decade of ocean observations? Is it a system, a specific technology or a group of technologies? Is it the application of an approach or hardware from another industry? Or is it something entirely different? Frank, go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting me. I'll break the ice. I guess I'm not too shy about this. And uh, thanks for setting up these sessions. I, I think that the question is gets a, a lot of dimensions here, but I think one of the more most fundamental needs that we have is human capacity and how we organize our learning strategies and how we train scientists that may or may not be tied to industry, government, and public needs. Uh, at the moment, that connection is not very robust, especially in the developing world. So I think that part of the technology solution has to be coordinated education systems in a way that we haven't done before, uh, where we include things like interoperability and standards, conventions in oceanography, and coordinate this around the world. I think that that's very fundamental. So I think all of this ties into a need for organizing information and data. So that has a lot of implications for information technologies, how we transfer and share oceanographic data is pretty critical. And I, I say it across disciplines. I think some disciplines may be more mature than biology is, for example, but I think that we need to do this across the board. Thanks, Frank. Uh, David and then Colleen. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, my name is David Legler. I work in NOAA and I direct the Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the question. And kind of following on your prompt here, I think of sort of where the where we're going to see the biggest transformation is in kind of two areas. Um, I think, firstly, the the new generation of sensors that we're 
we're seeing come online or they're being developed um, and it's, they're really targeting the new areas of where we need the most help in terms of biogeochemistry in the ocean, the ocean health or life on the ocean. I see that as kind of revolutionizing our, our scientific understanding, our monitoring, enabling new capabilities in terms of ocean prediction and assessment. And then complementary to that, I also see that I think low cost, small, easy to deploy. Um, you can think of those kind of platforms or combination of platforms and sensors. In my mind, that's gonna overcome some of the big challenges we have in small disadvantaged communities uh, globally who are really struggling to find solutions to the informational needs uh, that they have and to help them participate in the new blue economy, if you will, and really take advantage of, of the value of ocean information. So I, I kind of see the transformation coming in a couple of different areas. Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, Colleen and then Susan. Thanks, Chris. And uh, I'm Colleen Hahn with Metron. And I'd like to kind of dovetail what was said already in that I think the transformation to enable empowering uh, um, data collection, data observation is coming in several areas. It's the whole ecosystem. Um, as one speaker mentioned, as the material science and the sensor adaptions and adoptions, the more robust technologies out there, it's driving the prices down and it's advancing our ability to um, have multiple programs to do those large scale kind of data collection um, ocean observation programs. So it's, it's really the ecosystem of the tech and also the finances, right? I think the more private public partnerships or how we tap in across governmental agencies and, um, and kind of industry to enable these programs and provide sort of a cost reduction to, to do the data collection and observation programs, I think that's a really critical factor. And then education, I do agree. So again, I look at it more from the ecosystem. We're in autonomy. And uh, the autonomy systems in general depend on many, many things, sensors, mission planning, all those things, right? So I think that's a critical element. Yeah, good point. And, and I want to note that I, I will circle back on the broader ecosystem piece as our conversation goes on today, um, beyond, beyond the hardware focus of this conversation. Uh, Tosta and then Bruce. Oh, thank you, Chris. So I, I want to echo a little bit what, what I have heard here. And I, I think that the key element here for the future is to be able to utilize assets in the water that are not necessarily scientific platforms, which will require inexpensive sensors and standardized in many ways, in both physically, you know, size, but also in terms of virtual in, in software interfaces and you know how you communicate things. So we need an easy to easy to use kind of plug and play modular systems that are inexpensive and then you know secondary maybe low power consumption and low weight. So we can utilize platforms that we normally not use. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to pull Susan in because her hand dropped back down and then back up and then we'll go to Bruce. Yeah, sorry, I'll kick off the mark there. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Susan Hanna with Canada's Ocean Supercluster. Maybe just a quick comment, you know, in, in line with some of what I heard just now from some of the others around the lowering of cost and the increasing utility um, of uh, sensors and sensor platforms. I mean, we, we're definitely observing a real paradigm shift in um, the ability of companies to be able to better um, develop and draw AI enabled solutions because of this. And I think, you know, it's really important to understand the transformational impact that the use and the adoption of AI is going to have, um, especially vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, some of the um, increasing power, lower costs uh, that we're seeing in some of the technology platforms. That, and just generally, I think that that is an area where there's going to be a real transformation, even within the next five years, you know, up until now, um, AI you know, adoption in most ocean sectors has been in the single digits um, with maybe the exception of the offshore oil and gas industry. But um, 
you know, there's a real pivot that's starting to take place um, real time. And it's gonna, I think, drastically, you know, in terms of the types of sectors and even the market opportunities, it's gonna drastically change the outlook in terms of the um, applicability and the um, relevancy of AI-driven solutions as it relates to sensors and sensor collection. Absolutely, Susan, thank you. Uh, Bruce and then Ryan. Yeah, uh, Bruce Howe, University of Hawaii. Um, I'm chair of the uh, Joint Task Force for uh, Smart Subsea Cable Systems. Um, I think uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges is is the provision of of power in the deep sea. In the deep sea, um, and I mean, we absolutely we need sensors to make the the measurements. But the major cost in 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 ocean observing is the platforms and access uh to the uh to the ocean itself and as as i see it um the use of subsea cables can provide that uh and basically levering leveraging this this large industry to our advantage uh to provide basically uh uh ultimately it's not quite there yet but uh power and 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 communication um on the seafloor and and above the seafloor um, so I think in, in our discussions, we need to understand that um, a major cost, and, and, and I'm thinking much of the deep sea here, uh, is in access and, and thinking of sustained observations over decades and centuries. Um, you know, we, we, we have to eliminate the ship and, and, uh, uh, in, in that process because that's so costly. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Ryan and then Matthew. Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. I've just changed my audio system here. If it's not working, please, everyone start waving. Um, I've never heard so many answers to a question that, that I, I agree with them, them all, actually. So all of the above there. But the key thing I wanted to kind of flag up was um, uh, when we think about what's been really disruptive, in, in our ability to gather data and transmit data on observed systems terrestrially in, in the last few decades, it's absolutely been the internet. Um, that's That's been a truly disruptive force. And I think what one of the, the challenges we've had in the ocean environment is we, we don't have access to the internet in the same way there. Um, that access is, is happening now. It's it's increasing with, with low earth observation satellites, for example, or um, low earth or orbit satellites allowing us to have true broadband communication in the ocean space. I think that coupled with many of the factors already discussed, but for example, cheaper, lower spec sensor technologies that are easily deployed for longer in the ocean, but can transmit in real time. So, I, so we're moving from this paradigm of at the minute we put our instruments in the ocean at high expense, we leave them there, we recover them at high expense, we get data off them and we analyze. We're going to move from doing that to actually that data coming from those sensors to our phones. Um, and as some have mentioned already, some of that analysis haven't been done with, with machine learning. So I, I think that's that's going to be a, a, a key uh, game changer uh, going forward now. This, this idea of the Internet of Things at sea. Thanks. No, that's a great point, Ryan. And I want to circle back on that in a few questions, really to dive deep on, on AI ML. Um, Matthew and then Chris. So I'm going to um, just highlight that I think the move to net zero and observing itself is going to exert a design pressure on what we do and the nature of observing. So ships are not only costly, but they're also not very carbon efficient. And so that's going to drive practice to greater non-ship systems. Um, and having gone down that road a bit, I think some of the key technologies they're observing may not be that small, actually. Um, a number of the EOVs, a number of the things that we all want to measure are hard to measure. And the thought that they will all be addressed by small, cheap sensors is probably not realistic in at least the next couple of decades. So I suspect we're going to end up with some of them are going to be small and, and cheap and robust and all the rest of it. But there's going to be a, a big rump and a lot of EOVs that can only be measured with relatively big systems. So what we've recently been doing is putting very large numbers of chemical and biological as well as physical sensors on things like uh, autonomous, you know, sizable autonomous vehicles. And then you can get very complete data sets that replicate what a ship can do 
Um, but it's actually quite a big pro, uh, platform and it's reasonably big um, sensors. And the overall cost is certainly not disposable. It's a significant asset when it's in the water, but it can generate a huge amount of data and the cost per data point is then much more realistic. And I think we've got to be careful about hoping we're going to have cheap, robust, disposable sensors because the development cost of making something cheap is much, much higher than making something slightly larger that's a bit more expensive. And that's therefore a bit more um, realistic. The technologies that are coming down the track that enable all of that are, are um, things like the molecular technology re uh, revolution some of us have been playing with for a while, eDNA, DNA, um, measurement technology, sequencing, <clears throat> biosensors using um, antibodies, atomers, aphemers, whatever it is to, to make measurements. All of that technology is, is, is working outside of oceanography and increasing the in oceanography. That's going to be really exciting. Uh, but I think there's a lot happening around robotics. <clears throat> some of the uh, some of the things we want to measure are very complicated, you know, rates, biogeochemical rates. We really need robotics uh, to perform in situ experiments to do that. So robotics will enable that. And I suspect because of the size and the energy of all these systems, uh, the coupling of energy harvesting, battery technology and autonomy will provide platforms that can do all of some, all of this or some of this um, without the need uh, of the carbon producing ship. So that's where I see some of the trends. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Chris and then Anthony. Morning, everyone. Sorry, I had some technical issues here. So if you're if you're looking at my. Uh, screen the image that's actually my wife that's not me so <laughs> this is the only way i could connect uh, one of the things i think that's really going to drive innovation is the actual specific applications you know we're talking about things in generalities you know we want more sensors we want you know more data we you know everything everywhere all the time and that's that's great but i think it until you have a very specific application and particular requirements, then you don't drive the innovation you need to really make this, these big leaps. And so, for example, I saw Dan Rogers on the phone here. Uh, great example, he was just uh, visiting us talking about his marine carbon dioxide removal for going to sell carbon credits in that market. One needs a measurement uh, reporting and validation strategy in order to underpin that uh, that enterprise, so that suddenly puts on very specific requirements about what what you measure at what time, what space scales, it, it, with certain targets in mind. That drives innovation. So I think when we talk about this overall ocean observing enterprise, we have to bring ourselves down to these very very specific use cases, uh, not the generalities, but very specific things. And I think therein we see. It's a system of systems. How things actually work together will be what what you know really drives us into the future. No one thing's going to do it all. There's no single sensor that can be comprehensive and solve all of our problems. So, how we mix and match these things and apply them in very specific use cases, I think, is where uh, the future lies. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, let's go, Anthony, and then Benedict. Uh, hi, this is uh, Anthony Hoogs from Kitware. I apologize for the background noise here. I'm, I'm broadcasting from uh, Dallas Fort Worth Airport. I just came in overnight uh, from Honolulu. Um, so my background, and I, my picture doesn't work. The Wi-Fi here is a little uh, weak. But my background is in computer vision and artificial intelligence. Uh, so I certainly come at this uh, from that perspective. And what I expect in the next decade uh, for ocean science is what we've seen for other sciences and, and aspects of, of the data-driven AI revolution. We have an enormous number of potential platforms that can help ocean science. Some are available now and more are coming online. For example, these huge constellations of imaging satellites that are imaging the Earth every few days, like planets constellation, for example. They're not designed for ocean science, but they could certainly help it with the coverage and period periodicity of collection unlike we've ever had before. Uh, that's that's truly cool. Similarly, we'll have platforms uh, that that are cheap and easy, as we've we heard other panelists mention, I totally agree with on the autonomy side, um, much more um, 
of an attractive price point for, for collecting the data that way. Very dense data in certain areas where those platforms go, such as wave gliders and other fully autonomous systems that can move around. And some of that will be imagery. And imagery under the, under the ocean is obviously a very limited field of view, but it is a very rich source of information when you have it. It's like a little spotlight under the water. Uh, and I think we, we already do a lot of work on that with NOAA. I think we'll see a lot more of that. So I think that combination of all of this proliferation of platforms collecting a ton of data coupled with AI is going to bring enormous revolutions in, in the potential for, for data-driven discovery here in ocean science. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, we're gonna get through three or four more folks and I'm gonna ask a different question. Uh, so Benedict and Jodica. Yes, hi. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I'm Benedicto Ferre, and I um, uh, I work at the University of Tromsø in Norway, and I um, I'm an oceanographer, and I work with um, uh, ocean platforms such as uh, landers and uh, and moorings, and and also observations, main observation in the ocean. So I'm really I'm I'm in agreement with everything that has been said now, and uh, and in particular in terms of uh, sensors and. Um, battery consumption that are always um, uh, a very important aspect also in terms of funding because uh, they always uh, cost uh, a lot of money due to their power consumption. And so there's really um, uh, um, a high demand for more researchers to have uh, um, battery efficient. Uh, and, and, um, and so with this, I agree that we should try to use the system to, um, uh, to regenerate the batteries. And, uh, and in terms of sensor, um, having um, some cheaper, easier to use sensors would be really um, uh, appropriate, I think, most of all um, now, because as it was mentioned also, all the ship um, the ship cost is high and the uh, ecological impacts of research vessels is also very high. And so if we could have very easy to use sensors, we could also use some ship of opportunities um, more easily. And um, um, I think there's also now a really good work that is being done in terms of outreach. And so we talk to the public more and more. And, uh, and that's, that includes um, fishermen, tourists, um, touristic boats and everything. And so if we could have easy to use sensors that could just be deployed from, uh, from any ships uh, with or without the help of researchers, I think that would be really beneficial also. Thank you, uh, Jodica, and then Siebert. Thank you. Um, I'm Jodica Bamani. I'm the executive director for the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Um, and this is, uh, uh, as uh, one of the previous speakers mentioned, uh, I agree with uh, all that's been said before me. Um, I think um, the uh, what we're where I see uh, real advances, uh, as it was mentioned in the introduction, was in material sciences, and so um, and that is where we can address the uh, low cost, smaller sensor technologies as well as renewable energies. So, for example, I think last month MIT announced their new solar panel that's uh, on a material; it's flexible, and you can stick it to different surfaces. So now that means that you may not necessarily for the surface uh, and above sea surface uh, sensors, you don't need batteries. So now you can start to make those smaller. So I think if we look outside and see what's going on outside, there are things that we could certainly pull in that make uh, the sensor technology smaller and cheaper and very importantly, renewable energy at the surface. I agree with what Bruce said about uh, communications as well. That's key. Um, and I think one of the other uh, speakers also mentioned low Earth orbiting satellites. Um, that is a game changer, the Internet of Things. Um, included in that is, of course, bringing in edge computing uh, capabilities to those technologies at sea. Um, so that whole infrastructure is where I see ocean observing uh, really shifting. And then we have different ways of uh, assessing and analyzing the data coming online, including things like augmented reality. And that will change how we as humans actually intersect with the ocean. Uh, so I don't want to leave that off the table either. Good point, Jodica. Um, I'm going to circle back to some of the points you just raised after, after Siebert and Samuel with a, with a different question. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. I uh, wasn't having some problems with uh, audio and video here this morning. Uh, I could say that I agree with everything that was heard so far. Uh, low power, remote sensors, uh, the physical science. Uh, one thing that I'd like to bring up is environmental sensitivity. So if we put a lot of these sensors out there, they should be um, you know, undesirable <laughs> by animal, other by marine animals, uh, fish, uh, or organisms. They don't want to you know, eat them. Um, the sensors should be uh, able to have to communicate, like uh, we've heard a couple of times today. Uh, and we should be able to recover them uh, quickly and easily. Uh, that may require um, special vessels to go out and get them. So the whole system, I think somebody mentioned system of systems. <clears throat> There's going to be a need to have not only the sensor itself, but also all the support behind it. Um, and that, in, you know, not, not necessarily the direct science, but that require that includes the um, long-term environmental uh, studies, uh, the impact of how the sensors are working and distributed around the world. Um, country, you know, we've got international borders to worry about. Um, uh, fishing uh, in vessels picking up these sensors, how are we going to deal with that? Um, so uh, there's a lot of, um, I guess, the non-science challenges that have to be addressed. Uh, with this next generation of sensors. Um, uh, my company, GuideStar Engineering, we're very uh, interested in all of these aspects that have been brought up. And uh, we really look forward to the next, you know, several years and uh, deploying uh, sensors that just make that ocean ob observing uh, possible. Thanks, Hubert. Uh, Samuel. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so I'm Samuel Stanton from Nature Metrics, and I'm going to go with the theme and agree with everything that's been said. It's an interesting conversation so far. And I think perhaps my point stems on from that, the fact that everybody is coming on and saying we agree with the views. That's part of what we're doing at the minute as we're developing our technologies and we're developing our abilities. For me, that offers the possibility to integrate. We have a very traditional point of view of a, a vessel goes out and does a biological survey it goes out and do a geophysical survey a geotechnical survey as sensors get smaller and their power demands decrease and the communications improve then our ability to integrate have multi-platforms don't collect biology data when you could also be collecting chemistry and geophysical data at the same time and i think if you can integrate then you can drive efficiency and you can get those efficiencies in two directions you can get them in a physical way. So we're talking about power and communications. We can streamline that through efficiency. And of course, cost. If we've got one platform out there that was doing what three platforms were doing, we've driven a cost efficiency as well. And those things together give us more data. And that's what we all want, isn't it? Once we've got more data, we can make those better decisions. And we've got integrated layers of data for making more informed decisions. So for me, I think that's the really key thing with, with these conversations at the minute, making sure we're not just focusing on our one area of expertise all the time, but we're thinking, how can we integrate my solution with the solution down the road to add that layer of data without increasing the cost on us on the similar curve? Great points. Thank you. Uh, Dan, do you want to have the last word on this one? <laughs> Thanks, Chris, and uh, sorry for jumping in uh, a little late, but uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Dan Rogers with the Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA-E. Uh, so at ARPA-E, we're very much focused on, you know, the commercialization of the marine technologies uh, uh, developed under ARPA-E programs. And, you know, I'm thinking about what I think is kind of the premise of the dis this discussion, which is connecting industry to ocean observing and identifying the white spaces and the overlaps um, between academic interests and an industry interest. And for example, ARPA -E has programs in uh, uh, floating offshore wind platforms, in offshore seaweed aquaculture, and as Chris mentioned, a uh, potential upcoming program on uh, marine carbon dioxide removal, all of which are going to require, uh, you know, ocean sensing and data collection, not for strictly ocean observing uh, uses, but for permitting 
uh, you know, uh, purposes and, and, and environmental monitoring purposes. So I'm trying to think about how we can connect kind of these secondary needs of industry, which are going to grow tremendously over the next decade and beyond because of economic incentives. How can ocean observing kind of piggyback off of um, these growing and emerging industries and to, to help fill the data and information gaps that we have currently? Thanks. Absolutely. Good point. Um, okay, so just a, an update for everyone. There are open questions in the Q&A. So as we have conversation running, please feel free to check those and layer in thoughts and answers to, to what the, the broader community is asking. Um, but to move our conversation forward, I actually want to pick up on a thread that a few folks have mentioned. And so you know, we've underlined the rapid maturation and widespread use of, of AI, of computer vision, edge computing, augmented reality, digital twins, sort of a, a, a basket of similar technologies. And considering that growth, what are the challenges that need to be overcome in leveraging these capabilities to advance the entire ocean observing enterprise? Gabrielle? I'll just jump in with a few thoughts um, about maybe challenges, but maybe opportunities. I think um, we've heard a little bit here in the discussion, but also maybe in the questions about the opportunity around um, focusing innovation to meet real needs. Um, in some cases, these are, you know, there are technology solutions for really big problems that we're addressing in a multilateral way across sectors. But I think we don't want to lose sight of that, um, the, the real local needs that we have for ocean observations, the community needs, and the gaps um, that we're that we see in some cases um, to really enable decisions um, for sustainable use of marine resources. Etc. And I think um, there's a real opportunity in the expanded conversation, for example, around co-design and um, the really um, targeted conversations about how we speak to users of ocean observing information um, to be able to inform the investments that we make in ocean observing platforms, in development and innovation of sensors. Um, and so I think that that, that needs to be a, a real um, focus and, an, and it's an important part of the conversation. It does present a challenge because reaching into some of those communities and then bringing the feedback into a conversation across industry, across science or you know, government implementers of ocean observing systems, um, it, it's difficult to make to build those kinds of co connections and it has to be iterative. It's not a one-off conversation. It's uh, a, probably a, a change in how we develop our ocean observing activities and prioritize the kind of data collection and technology development that we're all embarking on. Um, so I, I wanted to bring that piece into the conversation. I think it's reflected in questions like, what data will be used for and by whom. Um, I don't think we have all of those answers yet. And I think um, that's something that the ocean observing community for sure is talking quite a lot about. I think there are real uh, opportunities for a rich conversation with industry too, um, you know, where there will be perspectives on what, what the needs are for ocean observing data and, and, and that then informing um, innovation and, and new technology development. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Matthew and John. So uh, I'm by, by no means an, an AI expert, but I've been working at looking at how it can be used for um, EOV assessment. And I think it's it's very good for some variables, some things that we need to measure it's, it's really good for. Um, and I think some of the promising areas I've been working in is looking at uh, using machine learning and AI to do taxonomy and characterization of, of big data sets, it's things like imaging and acoustics data, um, particularly have been involved with. And, and there's an interesting link between AI and machine learning and simulation. So, and we've been looking at using simulation to create trainings 
uh, data sets for AI and machine learning, because one of the problems, one of the bottlenecks with using AI, for example, for doing taxonomy from images is actually you need a fairly large training set with humans uh, that have, have characterized it and humans make mistakes and then the, the machine can can either copy those mistakes or uh, or gets confused by them. Um, so, so I think that's an important aspect that we need to think about, and that that looks pretty promising actually. Using using computers to generate very clean training sets to train artificial intelligence and uh, and machine learning. So, yeah, that's my experience. I think that it can win in some areas. There are some things though that AI digital systems just can't help you with. You know, it's very difficult to foresee how AI could help you with uh, chemistry of seawater, for example. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, John. Hey, good, good morning, Chris. Uh, thanks for, for, for hosting this here. I, I really wanted to, to, to jump in and, and talk. I'm from a DARPA and did the Ocean of Things program. So I, I, I'm glad to see that the conversation is changing here with distributed uh, large spatial temporal sensing and want to engage people in the use of these new data sets that are becoming available with the commercial sensors being distributed on the ocean. I think this is really a third efficiency. Um, you know, we were talking about those first two efficiencies um, earlier, but I think the third efficiency is once we have this data, and I am not a believer in strict standards, but more a self-labeling ontology of the data so that systems and um, modern computer science techniques can be applied to them, right? So this is not a, it's a schema on read versus a schema on write that talks about the characteristics of the sensors and the platforms uh, so that you can make the most value of this data. Right now, I still see a strong bias in the analytic community, whether it's academic or commercial, to only want to play with your own data and then figuring out how to integrate and assimilate across uh, data sets and platforms. I think you see this great synergy. And to kind of ans answer Ravi's question in the, um, in the uh, question and answer say, really EOVs that are um, related to what we, we've called in Ocean of Things uh, being a, all of the hotel sensors. So everything that you could get on your cell phone today camera, accelerometer, GPS, temperature, barometric pressure, those really work well with getting to a high density of what I'll call commercial scale measurements, not cheaper measurements in that, because the sensor quality has been driven by the um, cell phone industry, uh, where specialized uh, sensors need to be designed are for things like uh, eDNA, specialized uh, chemical sensors and things like that. But there's a new class of EOVs that we're not talking about and really weren't in the white paper. And these have to be, these are the bio, biogenic or anthropogenic activity-based variables in the environment. So where is biologic activity, whether that's background noise from strapping shrimp, whether these are effluents from, um, you know, ships moving through with, you know, so we've looked at things like um, looking for the chemical byproducts of combustion, looking at the bioluminescence. These are things that are new types of EOVs and figuring out how they're tied to activity and not just environmental or um, more like scalar measurements. Um, and, and that, and those will really move. And when you get these at scale move, to the sub mesoscale features in the ocean. So features that are kind of under hundred kilometers in size, we're seeing great improvements in the modeling and forecasting of these high resolution features. And that's why you need to move to these types of measurement campaigns then augmented with the specialized sensors to do specialized uh, EOV measurements. That's great, thanks, John. Uh, Rohan and then Frank. Thanks, Chris. Um, hi, I'm Rohan Allen. I work for the Department um, for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in the United Kingdom. Um, and so my, my point's a little bit um, a little bit of a slightly different one to what's been, been discussed, um, which is 
uh, sort of as these new sensor technologies are being developed um, and are being deployed, I think there's a real need to, to, to think about how um, how the performance of those sensors is is being um, uh, is, is being measured and developing sort of necessary standards and, and quality assurance processes throughout the trust amongst the community to actually transition from um, techniques that are being used currently into the adoption of, of new sensors. And so I think that's a key challenge that, um, that really does need to be considered. And a lot of that may be running programs in parallel using using older technologies to, to validate new technologies. And that's really going to be key to unlocking, sort of taking um, taking on new sensors and getting that kind of wider spatiotemporal resolution unlocked. But fundamentally, um, and I, I tend to wear a, a policy hat with my role, fundamentally, if we're looking at using these data to inform our sort of statutory monitoring obligations or to inform our policy needs, we're going to need to make sure that we're, you know, we're happy to be integrating these new sensor technologies into long-term data sets um, and, and sort of being willing to, uh, to sort of hang our hats on, on the, the precision and accuracy of those sensors so um that's yeah that's uh, my point thank you thanks Rohan. uh frank and susan yeah and frank Miller carger at the university of south florida and i'm i'll talk a little bit from the point of view of, as a co-lead of something we call marine life 2030 which is an ocean decade program so the un decade of ocean science for sustainable development and what we're trying to do is connect uh, these types of observations, especially highlight the importance of measurements about marine life to satisfy the needs of people. And we all depend on marine life. Uh, you know, our own life is is marine life in many ways. So I, I think in I don't think that we have, even though we talk a lot about miniaturization power, AI and such, the amount of observations about biology and biodiversity that we collect and we have collected over the past couple hundred years is very, very small. And so it's very difficult to, to get um, data flowing into a forecasting system that can forecast ecological function and ecosystem services if we don't have that type of data. On the other hand, we know that there's a lot of data being collected by a number of people and that data is not flowing because either they're not using standards or there's a, some reluctance to share the data. And there's a, th these are all areas that we need to think about very carefully. So it, it's great to invest in gizmos and, and technologies, but there's also some political human aspects of data that we need to address. I think ultimately this is a part of how you link human needs to observing and through education. Uh, so I, I think collecting biological data, including social and economic data about our own life is pretty critical in this, everything that we're talking about. Thank you, Frank. Um, Susan and Ryan. I think, yeah, um, Susan Hunt again with the uh, Ocean Supercluster, maybe just a, probably a good follow-on comment to what Frank just said when you talked about challenges associated with AI and some of the high technologies. The first thing that came to my mind is talent. And I know it's a really obvious one, um, but still, you know, we're in an era where it's extremely hard uh, to be able to find the right people. Um, but you know, associated with that challenge is what you know is is really a growing opportunity for the ocean sector. I think writ large, and so far as you've got an increase in governments uh, in terms of making an influence in the sector, you have an increase in the amount of investment going in the insect the sector. You have an increase in sort of the, the motivation for youth to get involved in something that matters. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, critical to thinking about a really, you know, significant challenge in the space is also just the opportunity that exists around um, promoting the ocean opportunity and, um, and soliciting new talent into the sector. Good point, Susan. We're gonna, we're gonna circle back on that piece in a little bit too. Ryan and then Nikhil. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> uh, Ryan Moore at RS Aqua in the UK. Um, th this has been touched on. I just want to go back to it briefly. Matt raised it and John raised it as well. But the question, I think one of the, the, the aims, important parts of it was this idea of machine learning, which we, we know is going to be so helpful. But Matt's right. Without, without the training sets, the foundational models labeled, um, it's very difficult to build machine learning algorithms um, uh, um, for, for certain types of data. We work in underwater acoustics. Um, for those of you that, that know, these are these are massive data sets. There, there are already machine learning algorithms that do 
half decent job at, at identifying certain signatures and that. But it's unbelievable. Here in the UK, when we when we talk to the different groups and from sectors, you know, like defense right through to conservation, about where they're getting their their the data sets to do their labeling and to build their models from. The, the ones they use, there's like a handful of them. They always bear back to the, the JASCO system at, at Vancouver Harbour, actually. Um, and so people that work in acoustics will know that. But for, for us in the UK, I know lots of different groups doing this type of, of, of data gathering, large acoustic data sets, but we're obviously not sharing them. And <clears throat> and, and that's, that's a key thing here. So if we're going to use machine learning to analyze big data, then we, we need to do a much better job of, of, of sharing the data sets where the different groups are already gathering and have been gathering in, in the ocean for some time. So yeah, that's it. But the, the, the need to do that much, much better than we currently are. That's great, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, Nikhil, and then Freya. Right. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, so I'm uh, with Ocean Visions and I work with closely with startups and others working on uh, marine carbon dioxide removal. I'm not an expert in cloud computing and AI, but just wanted to bring up a challenge with respect to the critical need for real-time data sharing so that data can be fed immediately into models to improve forecasts and, and, and measurements that are pretty challenging when it comes to measuring the uptake of uh, carbon uh, against a, a background uh, um, of... Uh, uh, yeah, so that's sort of one of the things, uh, major challenges that we see. Thank you. Thank you. Priya and Anthony. Yep. Hi, all. Um, I'm Priya Che. I work at Carbon Plan, which is a nonprofit research group broadly interested in open source tools that improve transparency and integrity of conversations around carbon removal. Um, just wanted to more explicitly call out the opportunity of, of cloud computing. Um, a lot of the cloud hosted scientific computing efforts we see currently are, are open source efforts. So I think there is both a challenge and an opportunity in conversations about how to support that work, how to develop those tools in ways that building on John's point and Ryan's point, um, enable more efficiency, enable better access, enable sharing of data sets. Um, I think huge opportunity and real challenges there. Thank you. Anthony and Dan. Yeah, I think Frank and, and Ryan and now uh, Freya and others echoed this um, sharing of data. When I first got into the ocean, sorry, is my audio bad? <laughs> That's better. When I first got into the oceanography community starting five or six years ago, um, I did find it to be very, very fragmented. Uh, and in a data sense, there's all kinds of labs collecting all kinds of data funded by different organizations with different levels of government and academia, mostly. And there's tons of data that, that could be shared and be really useful to people, but they don't know about it or they don't know how to share it. So I, I do think building some kind of infrastructure around uh, facilitation of data sharing would be a kind of a nuts and bolts contribution, but potentially the most impactful one uh, we could make. I suggested this, there was a NOAA workshop on AI uh, where I mentioned this on a talk, um, where not only sharing the data, but having a centralized model for the structure. I'll sign off here, sorry, I'm getting back on the All right, we will circle back on Anthony. Um, Dan and Benedict. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so I want to maybe take it back to more of a look at the hardware side of ocean sensing. Um, and and again, back to this idea of commercialization and how, you know, a big barrier to ocean observing and, and sensor innovation, I'm sure, is just moving sensor technologies out of the lab and into the market. And so uh, a, a, about half the teams that ARPA-E funds agency-wide are academic labs. And, you know, occasionally we have PIs that just aren't interested in, in the commercialization of their technologies. They're happy to build the prototype and see that it works and then pass it off to somebody else, but they don't always find those uh, technology to market partners. And so ARPA-E often finds itself in this position of funding the research to prototype phase and then assisting 
uh, and finding other private follow-on investment between prototype and demonstration and beyond. Um, and so, you know, I, I would I often think about how many incredible low-cost transformational sensors are being built in at universities across the country and end up sitting in the lab because a, a grad student graduates and moves on or uh, the, the PI moves on to a, a new new funding opportunity and a new project. And, and it, that technology exists and is there, but is not brought to market and doesn't have the impact that it could. Um, and, and so I think there's real opportunity there to help bridge the lab to market aspects. And I think you're, you know, we're seeing organizations that are doing really good work in this. Uh, some that come to mind are, are Start Blue and Washington Maritime Blue that are spe uh, specifically focused on the ocean technology space, but uh, just something that we're thinking about here at RPE. Thanks, Dan. I, I want to come back to that in a second, but let's get Benedict, Chris, and Jodica, and then I'm going to shift gears. I'm really happy to go right after Dan because it's um I it, my point was uh, also in connection with this. I, I completely agree. There's there's a lot of in, instruments out there that are that are just sitting in shelves and that could be perfectly used and uh, and then we just restart the wheels because someone else is uh, is going to create another one. And also, um, I don't know if some others um, here have had this issue, but with um, with the current world situation, uh, it's very difficult to have some pieces. Um, from uh, either if you need to repair uh, a sensor or you need a chip or, or, or a chip or anything like this and uh, and to me that shows that we really need to increase the market and and that should open the opportunities to more um, industry to develop some of the equipment that we can get or just because the line of supply of supplies uh, is broken or dismantled somehow uh, so it's kind of uh, it's, it's Kind of in connection with uh, what Dan said, um, also in terms of sensor development and uh, and PCs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris and Jodica. Oh, we don't have your audio, Chris. Sorry, technical problems here. You know, building on what's been said uh, earlier. I think when it comes to biology, Frank really touched on this. We really have a. a very difficult time observing life in the sea. And one of the challenges in that regard is understanding the scales of coherency. You know, how many measurements does one need to make in order to say something about a patch of ocean and what's going on, let's say, with carbon flux uh, or primary production even? I mean, these are not a trivial you know, issues. And I think if we're going to really advance the power of some of what edge computing and uh, uh, communications between devices, you know, offers, it's going to have to be understanding that scale at which we must observe to say something quantitative. And we're just not there yet. So, you know, kind of back to Matt's point earlier, we may have to invest in some more expensive um, uh, technologies uh, and think about how we direct assets to make adaptive measurements because biology is patchy in order to really then inform the models that can help us do some of this prediction. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Jodica, go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanna actually pick up on um, Ryan and his, uh, you know, and others who've mentioned the data sharing and the inability for this community to truly break down those silos and share data. We. Uh, recently ran a workshop and one of the uh, with data centers and those who provide data to see where those barriers were and why there was not as, as easy a flow through. Uh, and there's a number of recommendations that are coming out of that. But one of them was that the data centers get sent data. However, it's missing the metadata. So therefore rendering it useless because it's been clear, the metadata has been stripped, it, the data has been cleaned and then it gets sent and the metadata doesn't get reattached. So one recommendation as this is for industry is can we hardwire the metadata to the sensor so that it doesn't matter, it will always be with that data that's collected by that sensor. Um, so that, that was one of the many recommendations that's coming out of that workshop. Um, and then I also wanna pick up on, I think, uh, Frank started this with the education, and it's been a theme throughout both of these last two questions. AI is actually augmented intelligence. 
I mean, we call it artificial intelligence, but really it's for humans. It's for us to do something with. It's not for, you know, the fish in the sea to utilize or whatever. So, so it's, it's augmented intelligence and we do need people who can, um, who have the expertise in these new technologies, in the artificial intelligence, uh, people who can innovate, who can use and understand and take action, which is what this is really all about is, you know, taking that action at the end. So just those are just two things that um, I'd like to raise at this point. Thanks. Thanks, Jodica. Uh, so I'm going to exercise my prerogative as moderator just to keep running through our break here because I have a number of questions I want to get to that are sort of consistent with what we've been talking about. So I'm just going to keep running. And if folks need to duck out for a few minutes, please feel free. Uh, and then we'll take a break before we get into the, the open conversation at the end. Uh, and I'll merge sort of questions from what would have been a larger landscape session into this continued flow. So I want to I want to circle back to something that, that Chris just noted and, and Frank had noted earlier about challenges in observing biology. And I want to just open this up broadly to everyone. What other challenges and opportunities exist for developing technologies and deploying them in observing systems to meet the needs of understanding biodiversity, chemical, biological EOVs, but also, as John noted, these emerging activity-linked biogenic and anthropogenic variables that are of interest. Samuel, go ahead. Yeah, I have my girl playing my head off the parapet first on this one. Um, uh, I'm going to link back to what Frank said as well, because one of the things that Frank said was really interesting. He said that we um, we lack some of that biology data and. I, I sort of agree with that up to a point, but I, I think it's perhaps not that we lack the data. I think it's the format that that data is in for biology that's the real problem, because so much of it is, is historic. So much, much of it has been collected from forms that don't lend itself very well to digitization over a long period of time, that probably we feel we haven't got biology data because we haven't got it in the right format. And I think that then goes back again to what Chris said right at the start um, on his first question. What's the application? What do we want that biology data for? What's the question it's going to answer? And I think particularly the way the world's changing now, where there's economic drivers for that biology data, where there's ESG commitments and the like, so the, the corporate world needs a method of integrating the, the biological data into the other data sets it's reporting. And I think that's the challenge for us. It's making sure that we've got the right type of biological data, taking what looks initially very complex and, and quite um, inaccessible and making that engaging but also mean something uh, but not both not just to the to the end users of the data but within those data sets as well so it's relatable to each other consistency i guess um one of the difficulties with biology data is always consistency and standardization i think those are quite big questions where because of the lack of the difficulty with digitizing biological data, we, we perhaps sit a little bit further behind the curve versus things like geophysics or oceanographic data where it's collected in a different manner. Thanks, uh, Matthew and then Tost. Yeah, so I think one of the <clears throat> challenges for me as an instrument developer, and that's broadly what I mostly am, looking at uh, those EOVs, biodiversity, biogeochemistry, and, and, and certainly the activity, it's, it's just the sheer breadth of how they're currently measured. Uh, so the techniques that are deployed to make good measurements of these things without using sensors and without using any autonomy right, it, it is, is huge. You've got um, massive laboratory instruments or very labor intensive laboratory techniques a lot of the time. Um, and so the challenge for me is to how how you can unify any of those requirements and how you can measure those with a restricted set of instrumentation or a restricted in uh, set of of tools because there's no way we're going to get cost and start size down if we've got to implement a hundred different measurement techniques just to do say say biology and, and biogeochemistry well so I think to me that's the challenge um, and I think that does and I think the EOV the essential ocean variable framework is very good about reducing uh, our requirements down to the bare minimum but even then the breadth of um, techniques that 
are required currently is a significant challenge. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Toast and Gabriel. Thank you. So I, I forgot to present myself last time. So I'm Toste Tanner. I'm working at Geomar Helmholtz Center Ocean Research in Kiel in Germany. I'm also co-chair of the GU Steering Committee. So I would like to reflect a little bit on the balance between having enough measurements in time and space versus having accurate enough measurements. And that comes back to what Chris was saying about the patchiness and variability of the system. So I think we need to have both. Uh, Matt was telling we cannot measure everything on small remote sensors and so on. We need some big instruments on ships and so on. But we also need that breadth of understanding that patchiness. So we have to balance the you know good enough measurements in terms of accuracy precision versus the cost of making these measurements. So find the right balance on that. And in, in that sense, we are now seeing a lot of sensors for biology and biochemistry being developed and being integrated in established networks. And, and one great example of that is, of course, BDC Argo, where a number of BDC variables are integrated in a subset of the Argo program. And similarly, on the Go ship uh, repeat hydrography program, where there's a lot of efforts on integrating new newish kind of technology for biology on an established program focused on physics and biochemistry. Uh, so I think we need to work a little bit on finding that right balance between the science grade, high precision, best possible things for understanding a process versus that little bit cheaper, more widely distributed kind of sensors that can give you an understanding of patchiness and, and trends and variability in the ocean. Thank you. Thanks, Tost. Uh, Gabrielle. Yeah, I also did not introduce myself. I'm Gabrielle Canonico from the US Integrated Ocean Observing System, but also co-chair of the Goose Biology and Ecosystem Panel. And that's kind of the hat that I'm wearing today. Um, I, we, we clearly still have some stove piping in the ocean observing community where we don't always talk across disciplines. And there's huge opportunity for, um, for efficiencies and for um, you know, stronger coordination around innovation if, if we are talking across disciplines. And I think Goose has been trying to address that and to, to improve that situation. Um, but in, in some, but it, it, it takes a lot of community building. And it's like, we almost need an imperative to be talking about biological data collections um, whenever we're talking about existing or new platforms or ocean observing initiatives so that we um, can, we explicitly explore the opportunities for marine life observations when we're making new deployments. Um, and then we can talk about the challenges, you know, what works, what doesn't work in a certain environment. And hopefully we're also talking about what the user requirements are for, for any new marine life observations. Um, I, I think investment in those data solutions is really important, and that's something that we that needs to be a part of any discussion around biological data is how we're kind of liberating those historical data, or um, what are the data formats, um, metadata requirements, data flows that best serve um, needs for interoper interoperable um, ocean observing information across disciplines. Thanks, Gabrielle. Uh, let's go with Bruce and Siebert, and then I'm going to ask a different question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just following up on the the I, uh, dilemma of you know, do you have many many less expensive and less accurate measurements versus uh, a few very accurate uh, uh, and more costly measurements? Uh, so that really brings up system engineering in my mind. How do you do global optimization? of the systems in a, in a system engineering sense. Um, and, you know, we've heard there are many, uh, we, we want fit for purpose uh, uh, systems. Uh, and we're, at least in my opinion is, you know, we, we're, we're using, uh, or different users have different requirements, but how do you combine all of those requirements together to come up with an optimal uh, infrastructure to support them. And, and I don't see that happening here. Um, that we, we need to not, not 
have stovepipes and co-design, but uh, well, and 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 somehow unify that. And and there are two two examples. Uh, so on land, you know, we're develop redeveloping our power grid, and electric vehicles are are a major part of that. Um, so how do we translate that those concepts into the ocean? Um, again, it's an optimization problem. Do you have uh, large electric vehicles that can go long range, or do you have uh, more vehicles, you know, with shorter range? And how do you supply the power for those? Um, and then uh, navigation under underwater. How do you provide that? Look at GPS. Um, you know, what has GPS done for our society, and and supporting across all users. You know, how do we get that kind of global system design uh into the into the mix here that's all Siebert. yeah i'd like <clears throat> i'd like to continue a little bit on some of the student involvement uh we have a program where we work with stem programs in schools and uh, we find students are really interested in local bodies of water uh, and you know and not only for recreation but also for the ecological impact that you know companies farming runoff or are having um i think there's a great opportunity to encourage students to be citizen scientists and of course go from as a you know as they go through uh middle and high school on choosing a college and and and, and career paths uh we can we can take advantage of that um i'm really looking for collaborators who are interested in developing either curriculum for that that work within um, short periods of time for classes uh or maybe even over uh you know high school semester field trips that kind of thing um, we really think that there's a lot of ideas and cultural sensitivity that is missed in classic science classes that can be um, uh, addressed by letting students feel that they're involved and they actually see the impact that they can make, uh, even if it's just going out to the local estuary and doing chemical sensors or uh, uh, you know bottom sampling and you know they get the microscope out and look at the uh, uh, zooplankton and you know and, and this sort of thing and they, they really get very excited about it. So I'd like to keep that in, engagement with them um, and uh, they have great ideas too to, you know for, for the future. Uh, but like I said, so I think that there's a, an entire path that we can encourage by being involved uh, with students early on and um, keeping their uh, interests going. Thanks, Siebert. I, I wanna actually ask a question on the, the workforce piece, but before I do, Colleen, do you wanna, do you have a comment on the biology question that you wanna wrap up with? I do actually, and and again, um, you know, I come from sort of a different perspective, both from industry. Um, Metron does data analytics, ML, and autonomy, and remote sensing solutions. But I just spent two years in the EV autonomous market, terrestrial, and I love what Bruce said. Is there an opportunity to form a task force? One of the things we they did collectively was sort of start this program of, you know, what are the parameters that we need for uh, for global, you know, um, sort of data, some of the data requirements and the applications and put some standards in there and kind of drive it from, from, from our collective intelligence that you all have in this group. Thanks, Colleen. All right. So I want to, I want to go a different direction, actually going back to, to Siebert's comment and what Frank brought up earlier and what a few folks have mentioned. So a number of people have, have talked about workforce development and student training. And, and the overarching question I wanna ask is what investments are needed to develop the workforce to meet the demands 
of a new blue economy based on ocean information. And a few sub questions here, are there specific programs that you consider a model for training this workforce? And how do we engage and directly support new talent in the ocean observing enterprise? And as some folks have noted in the Q&A, especially people who are coming from other industries where salary pressure makes it very difficult for government and ocean companies to both hire and retain talent. Frank, do you wanna do you wanna kick that one off? Yeah, first I wanna be one of cyber students in the way that he does things. So I I I think this question is fundamental for everything. And there are some things that we can do probably in the short term and some other things that may take a very long time. In the short term, I think it was Kiotica that also mentioned several have mentioned moving data and information technology. How do you bring that into this whole? thing, uh, this whole discussion, no? but the, over the long term, I do really think that with the social problems that we have today, the political problems, the, the economic problems that we have, if we don't infuse the, the linkage between science and solving problems for society early on uh, in the education process, it's gonna be a, we're not gonna solve the problem. It's always gonna be by serendipity. The other thing that we need to do is we, we all stand up. There's probably in the US a, 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 an ocean science program and a university every 50 miles down the coast and they don't talk to each other. Nothing is coordinated. The curricula are disconnected. We may use a textbook, but there is no, no coordinated way of teaching marine science how to deal with data, how to format and standardize observations in a way that it, it can then flow in a way, in an organized way. And this goes all the way to the professional level. So how do we take the brilliant programs that we have right now, be it in formal science or formal science and connect it all is a huge conundrum that I, is gonna take a long time to solve. And if the Marine Technology Society and NOAA, the Global Ocean Observing System, all industry can help uh, push this along and focus things uh, in a, in a useful way, that would be fantastic. Thank you, uh, Jess and Anthony. Hi everyone, um, thanks. Uh, been enjoying listening to the conversation so far. My name is Jazz Chambers and I um, chair a uh, NGO here in Australia called Ocean Decade Australia. And I think that this, conversa this um, particular topic is one that we spend um, most of our time on, which is trying to understand uh, what ocean literacy looks like more broadly, um, both in formal education and uh, and also just more broadly in industry. We have taken a view that um, ocean literacy is probably, uh, it, it is lower than I even anticipated when we started um, down our track two years ago. So there are currently some amazing opportunities that exist, one of them obviously being the United Nations Ocean Decade itself. And the framework that sits uh, around that, that is a framework that if you're not familiar with it, I do encourage you to go and find out about it. Um, it took many years to come um, up with that framework uh, that addresses ocean challenges um, and outlines ocean opportunities. And one of the big ones in there is ocean literacy um, and ocean knowledge um, and ocean literacy. My understanding is that ocean literacy has uh, was defined uh, over 20 years ago by colleagues in the US um, being uh, understanding the ocean's um, influence on you and your influence on the ocean. And that's a basic idea, but it's, it's a really essential one and it can be applied from, you know, low level um, kindergarten, preschool, um, through to high school universities and then into the professions. So I think using the UNDOS framework is, is one really key one. For around 17, there are 17 countries involved in the ocean panel. Um, so that's the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. That's another one that I would recommend people um, get their heads around. And what I like about that and what Chris has been talking about is, you know, users in that space. And we spend most of our time talking to the finance sector about what they understand and business about what they understand about the ocean and 
where they see themselves in ocean. And I can tell you now, we've interviewed hundreds of people um, in the last two years across finance, business, um, industry, all those um, areas that were listed in some of the background documents here, insurance, um, banking, uh, uh, agriculture, everywhere. And there is a very low level of understanding between the ocean climate nexus. Um, it has only just been recently put into um, some of those UN documents and uh, was recognised for the first time at COP uh, last year. One final opportunity that I would really um, emphasise uh, that I think exists for ocean literacy is the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures the TNFD. If um, I'm sure many, I can see some people nodding here, that is a really important one. And it's important for scientists to figure out how we are going to input into um, this framework, which is a risk framework uh, that big financial institutions, investors, et cetera, back to that ESG conversation we were talking about before, uh, is uh, uh, that that's, I think, probably the key opportunity right now. Um, and that's looking for um, how we take scientific information about nature and put it into systems so that people can make decisions um, in finance. So I'll stop there, but I'm enjoying the conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Jazz. Uh, Anthony and then Susan. So um, I, I completely agree that ocean literacy seems to be pretty, pretty, uh, very light in, in undergraduate and graduate education. But one concrete step we can take here, which might seem a little indirect, is to have more DOD and well-funded programs from rich agencies like DARPA and IARPA work on ocean science problems. And the reason this is conceivable is because often in a defense program, uh, a program manager needs a surrogate problem so that universities can work on it. So there might be some classified problem uh, with some hard challenges, um, and they want universities to work on this problem. But you can't have the real data, you can't know what the real problem is, if it's classified or sensitive. So they find a surrogate problem. Well, I've seen very, very few programs where that surrogate problem has anything to do with ocean science but they could, right? Instead they do things like cooking or, or some social media thing uh, that because the data is available, it's easy and people are familiar with it. So I think it's really an awareness question. Could more ocean scientists interact with more DOD elements who have much bigger pocketbooks than the ocean science community typically to get those problems and the data sets uh, ready for, for a DARPA program that comes along and is looking for a surrogate problem. This really could happen quite, quite readily in some cases I'm familiar with personally. The reason that this matters for literacy is because then you would have graduate students at 20, 25 universities sometimes on a given DARPA program. A single program can fund that many universities, so 30, 40 PhD students on one program. Most of those could all be working on your ocean science problem. And a lot of those people will have never seen an ocean science problem if they didn't have this experience. They would see social media or some other thing, which is much more typical in AI. And some of those who get it exposed might really get interested in it and realize that there are good, interesting problems out there. And so even if they can't make the kind of money they would make at an internet company, they might choose to go with a more science-based company that's interested in AI because they saw the significance and the interest in that problem. I face this all the time where AI talent like competing with Google and and um, Amazon and so on. And there are all these social media and retail type companies and people are going there because of the money, but in part it's because they don't know that there are these good alternatives and how interesting they would be and how meaningful they could be. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, Susan and Ryan. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with, with what was just said and maybe just a variation on that. Like we've been we've been talking a lot about um, you know, from a technology perspective before now, just like how the scaled um effort and a larger initiative is really some of the ways that we've been talking about things. And if you, you know, put the lens on that when it comes to talent as well, um, you know, like like what was said there a couple of minutes ago, there's lots of the variations of these smaller pipelines of talent that are being created by you know relatively small groups of institutions and and, and organizations and so if, if you can sort of 
build on that idea and think about it in a, in a much bigger scaled way, you would be able to create sort of a multifaceted set of opportunities for a much larger cohort of talents, uh, multidisciplinary talent from a variety of different feedstocks, for lack of a, a different um, uh, term, and, and sort of get um, a program and a community established that wouldn't be, that would really be agnostic, right, to a, a particular institution or a particular um, initiative, you, you have enough of a scale to really be able to develop a bit more of a, you know, a larger national pipeline of ocean talent. I know that's a big idea, but, um, you know, we're doing this already in lots of different ways in lots of different regions with, and that's actually harder if you think about it, um, you know, in the broad sense in terms of the amount of resources and the amount of time that takes. So, you know, especially if we're thinking about the outcomes of, of conversations like this one being larger scale approaches to doing business and advancing agendas in ocean. We, we could also think about doing that in the town space as well, I think. Yeah, good point, Susan, thank you. Uh, let's get Ryan, Dan, and Jodica, and then I'm gonna ask a different question. Thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in, in, in brief, um, we can't attract talent to the, the ocean observing sector if students don't know it exists. Um, and and I think that's a major problem, certainly here in the UK. I, I sit on a Society of Underwater Technology Special Interest Group in, into Environmental Sensing. There's a subgroup in that where a group of us are trying to attract, look at this problem of why we're not able to attract talent to the ocean science technology sector in the UK. And, and, and what we've, we find is that even those of us who work in it, never knew it existed when we when we studied ocean sciences you know you, you think about big uh, you think about ocean science in terms of research or there's aspects of industry you might think about it like ocean robotics which which can get students imaginations going and they, and they know exist but there's no policy initiative in the UK I think driving the growth of the blue economy generally that's a problem I think it's better in the US um, but because you have NOAA uh, um, and other agencies like that, but here we don't, and we we do have a lot of investment in the in the other industries, which which students are aware of and which gra grasp the best talent, basically. And, and I think that's what we really need to do a lot better here to to make people aware of this sector that we're all sitting here talking about. But I, I, the ocean observing sector that's very niche, isn't it? You know, and we all come from different angles and different sectors into it so you know it, it, it's a real challenge to make the students and the next generation aware of this really exciting and really important part of, of the blue economy good point ryan uh dan and jodica yeah and i'll i'd like to build upon that point a bit um and just again go back to this idea of trying to leverage investments from industry in broader blue economy spaces, right? So, so I, I would I would challenge the premise the premise of the question a bit and ask instead of how do we compete with higher paying you know Silicon Valley jobs, and instead ask well what what are the barriers to being able to provide you know young people in this space with competitive salaries, and you know I'm looking at some statistics right now estimates showing that the aquaculture industry uh is projected to grow from you know roughly 100 million dollars to six billion dollars in the us by 2030. um you're, we're, we're looking at enormous growth in the offshore wind industry and these are sectors with tremendous growth and that means job security uh for you know the foreseeable future and that means you know industries that are also you know other industries that are also looking to uh you know, develop a workforce pipeline. So how can the ocean observing community kind of tap into that uh, and again, leverage these investments uh, from other more specific applications in the ocean space? Thanks, Dan. Uh, Jodica. Yeah, I wanna, um... I want to say that we uh, we have this uh, amazing hidden superpower at our fingertips. And that's the magnificence of the ocean. And I can't tell you, as I skirt Silicon Valley from where I sit, the number of people who leave the high paying jobs and want to do something more meaningful and in the environmental space or oceanography 
and are asking how they can apply their talent. So, um, you know, a, a year or so ago, uh, we set uh, Eric and Wendy set up the Sh Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center for Data Science and Environment at Berkeley for that to address that need. But uh, we work directly with um, uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute works directly with the University of Chicago Computing Science Center, not the marine science, not the environment, but computer scientists at an educational level. And so I would say that everyone should reach out to their local, whichever university you're in or closest uh, location, the university computer science centers and uh, colleges and see if there are projects that their students would like to work on uh, as part of their training that already involve and include oceanography uh, and the data that you have. So that's one point. And then the other one is, um, I think, uh, you know, Chris, you'd said, are there any good examples? Well, uh, as, as far as training programs and things, we have an entire world of people uh, and there is a large swath of the ocean that doesn't have as many observations as we do in some parts of the world. Uh, and they don't have the technology, they don't have the resources, um, you know. So one program that comes to mind is from the Ocean Foundation who took pH sensors and did training courses in other parts of the world across island nations in Africa, and then left a handful of pH sensors so that the local scientists, once they were trained, could continue to collect data in areas that had zero observations of pH. So setting up programs like that so that it's, it expands across the whole planet. The ocean is so big that we need everyone from every country involved in in collecting these uh, measurements but that requires training and then uh, the resources to continue making those observations i like that idea jodica thank you i'm glad you brought that up i want to go a different direction so we've got about 20 minutes left before we take a break and have an open conversation with with everyone but i want to ask one more question to sort of take us to that point and it builds on something that, that a few folks have mentioned. So, so Rohan and Dan both mentioned different angles of the issue of technology transition and the integration of new sensors in the community. And so we recognize that industry acquisition and observing efforts can move somewhat quickly and government and academia move somewhat slower and the ocean processes we're trying to characterize sometimes take decades of observations to fully understand. How do we as a community need to view and or evolve our approach to deploying and integrating new and disruptive technologies? Chris, go ahead. Sorry, I would say that um, necessity is the mother of invention. So let's take the wind farm example. Uh, there will be a requirement for uh, and for permitting for certain environmental impact assessments, and it it will demand a particular set of measurements be made in a particular time and space scale. Therein lies an opportunity for business development, uh, for system deployment, uh, and for uh, teaching, training, bringing in this new generation. So I, I think it's these specific use cases really where all of this stuff comes together. Ocean literacy was mentioned, and I think it's absolutely essential. People don't really understand the value of the ocean. And I think for many people, they're thinking about this in terms of it's some sort of esoteric pursuit, and that's a nice to have. But when it becomes an actual business and an enterprise, <laughs> and it has economic value, it will draw people to it. And I think that's something that, um, that you know, these particular uh, the, the development of the blue economy is the way to bring in people and to drive that innovation. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Siebert and Rohan. Yeah, I want to say that uh, bringing industry in is critical. I agree. Um, we have to look at what the incentive for industry is, which is business. Uh, they have to employ people, and of course, you know the ubiquitous uh, profit motive. But um, I think ecotourism, 
as an area that we can look at. Uh, there's recreation, um, there's sports uh, that uh, we may be able to come up with, you know, ideas where those folks are um, willing participants in, you know, encouraging, you know, sensor placement, sensor recovery, uh, access to um, their vessels, um, you know, you, you know, even the uh, uh, transport, you know, tr uh, uh, transoceanic transport. Um, we talked some of some folks talked about uh, platforms acting as uh, just sensors as they go across the ocean, or even deploying uh, sensors um, along their uh, uh, transit uh, routes. So um, th there's a lot out there, uh, uh, just in terms of those few, um, uh, you know, coastal waters uh, support economies of, you know, every nation. Uh, so um, everyone, has, everyone has an interest. There's got to be great ways to bring industry in and, um, you know, just, just uh, get them excited about being part of programs that, um, uh, or just going to make the environment better for us. And, you know, obviously got to make it better for them too. Thanks, Siebert. Uh, Rohan and Gabrielle. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I just want to sort of reiterate that point, um, that sort of first point about, um, about there being real necessity, uh, a necessity to, um, to be able to integrate these, um, these technological developments and looking at it from a, from a UK perspective, um, we've got, you know, challenges on our marine monitoring and observation front in the sense of, you know, we're trying to move towards net zero um, and that doesn't play very, very nicely with uh, lots of large research vessel deployments. We have lots of new policy demands coming up online and um, coming online, which are demanding sort of new, um, uh, new types of data and sort of sim simultaneously to that, we're struggling with the capacity of our ships in the first place. So we're constantly having to make trade-off decisions about what data we do get out and collect and what data we don't. So all of that is driving us to a position where we absolutely need to integrate new technologies into our monitoring and observing systems um, uh, but looking at it from um, from a statutory reporting obligations perspective there's going to be real risk aversion um, so what I think is likely to need to happen is that as these new technologies reach um, a, a sufficient level of maturity to even be genuinely considered and, and candidates for integration they're going to need to run in parallel um, with our existing monitoring observing methods to make sure that they can meet our needs moving forward before we start to decommission um, our, our old technologies. And obviously that's going to come with significant cost issues and significant capacity issues, um, uh, or both of which things that the government should be supporting with. Um, but it's, it's likely to be a, a, a sort of challenging, challenging process from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle and Jazz. Um, yeah, the, the question about the, the construct of use cases that Chris brought up, I think is really interesting. And as we're talking about transition from lab to market or from research to operations, I think we can be really deliberate um, on, on the part of groups that are funding technology development, science, you know, related innovation we can require that elements are part of these funded activities, such as um, you know, applicants taking a, an applied approach, um, identifying a user that would commit to adopting a technology if, you know, if it proved effective in that application, um, engaging students or early career um, members in, in a project. And I think, that um, that is a mechanism, um, you know, through those funding opportunities to, to really make a commitment to transition of technologies. Um, one among many mechanisms I recognize, but but it's it's some it's something that agencies like NASA have had some success with, and I, I'm sure others that I'm less familiar with have have as well. But um, it it's worth considering. Thanks, Gabrielle. Uh, Jazz and David. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think this this issue that Chris has raised around use cases is really where my head goes to, um, because I think as a community, 
the ocean science, marine science community twisting this around and saying to ourselves, all right, what are the motivations of those users as opposed to the data that we want to collect or think we need to collect? What do they need? Um, that's the... I think that that's really got to, uh, that would be disruptive in itself to, I think, us as a community, uh, but also um, in terms of evolving the integration of technology into, we've mentioned offshore wind, but there's wave energy, fisheries and aquaculture, as I've mentioned before, insurance, shipping and fashion. It's incredible how many people in the fashion industry want new technologies. So biological products that they can start to use, plastics, et cetera. Um, and I really would encourage our community to, to start thinking about what is it that they need and what, what are the ways that we can then make that work for us in terms of ocean observing. Um, so start with what does, what does the sector perhaps require? Um, just getting them excited about the ocean is one thing, but at the end of the day, there is a bottom line to this. Um, I am finding, though, that uh, I was involved in a session recently. I think that using our um, ECOPS have come up a couple of times in the comments, early career ocean professionals. Using this next generation is really essential. I was involved in a conversation recently where um, we were describing what ESG was to young people and they were completely confused about why um, ESG had to be defined um, because from their perspective, they thought that that was what the system required anyway, that we were thinking about environmental, social and governance um, rules um, just naturally. That hasn't been natural for us. There is a changing environment. So using our young people and starting to think about where the motivation for potential users and clients of our, um, our data, that's where I'd be coming from. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. Uh, David and Matthew. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, I want to agree with earlier comments that Chris started about use cases, particularly new use cases, driving innovative introduction of new technologies, new capabilities. I do see, as others have commented, that's a really easy space for, um, for us to evaluate, introduce new kinds of technologies into sort of sustained observing space or the start of that. Where I think we're challenged is um, in our existing capabilities or, or needs where we have communities of observers, even users built around uh, sometimes even specific platforms. So for example, I know we have a lot of buoys around the coast and there are fishermen who want, they go and they want to see the data from that buoy. So because they understand it, they use it they optimize their activities, whether it's fishing or tourism around that platform. And so introducing new technologies, I think is a challenge. And we're not, we're still behind, I think, the curve on, on figuring out what that evaluation and introduction process looks like. I mean, it's something we're very interested in doing and we're trying that, and but we're, we're still struggling with that, but I think that because of that complexity and longevity that's already in place. Thanks, David. Uh, Matthew and Tost. So I think there's some really great opportunities. So I've, I've been involved with a, a program in, in the UK where we, we recently fielded 11 uh, chemical sensors for different parameters. So 11 chemical EOVs on a single platform. And that was also coupled with a new, brand new high accuracy primary productivity sensor. It's just an example of what, you know, the step change that we could make with some of the technologies um, that are out there, but get, getting those through into observations, there are some challenges around for, for a, so I'm both an academic and uh, have a company producing these at commercial scale. Um, it, there's some challenges around the clarity of the market and its market size and how you get the required investment uh, for what might be a relatively small market. And, and maybe it isn't, you know, actually sometimes when you get into these markets, they're not so small. And markets outside of oceanography can actually come in and support scale, and that makes it cheaper for everybody. Um, but I think, you know, as a community, if we could do, and this has happened in the past, but if we could do some things around uh, collective demonstration, so, you know, the, the uh, 
I think it was Rohan from DEFRA was saying, you know, you, you've got to take them through qualification alongside uh, existing methods. Well, that's a common problem to DEFRA regulatory testing, to NOAA, to, to the you know, Natural Environmental Research Council here in the UK. We probably don't need to do that three or four or six different times. We could do it. And once it's published, then then there shouldn't be a need to, to redo, uh, the, you know, measurements alongside uh, the, the existing methods. Um, and ultimately, what would, might be quite helpful is to do some kind of collective purchasing, if that's at all possible, and maybe at a goose level, that, that might help, certainly collective demo, possibly collective um, purchasing. And one of the interesting things that does happen in the military space is, um, is kind of pre-financing pre contracts. So there will be money available to meet a, um, a requirement, a need that will be given to the developers before the equipment actually exists in its high enough te you know, technology readiness level state. And it's if a community we could do that kind of thing, we could pull through some of these technologies a lot quicker. And that certainly accelerated things like the glider tech in, in our space. And that was a, a military uh, contract that brought, brought that through. So I think there's lots of opportunities and a few ideas that we could do to accelerate um, technology taker. Thanks, Matthew. All right, let's go with two more folks and then we'll stop for a few minutes. Uh, Tost and Dan. So thank you, Chris. So, so I'll answer your question on how we can incorporate new technology. And I come back to what David and Matthew were saying here on, on keeping backward compatibility of, of observations. We, we need to start with the requirements, right? So, so that's, that's the whole EOE of the framework of ocean observing philosophy. Think very hard on what you need to observe, what the question is. And then falls out of that the essential ocean variables and the types of observations you need. Uh, so then I think that is coming along. And then there are well established technologies or techniques how to move from one observing platform or one instrumentation to the next wave overlap and so on. So you know that you can keep your time serious for a long, you know, long enough time. Um, so to coming back to what Chris was mentioning on, on MCDR and, and how that can drive technology, I think that's completely right. There's suddenly an economic input or incentive to, to develop these technologies. But I would say that in a bigger societal view, there's a big economic input or incentive to actually understand the marine carbon cycle but it's not directly down to the company level. It's actually more on the government driven and there hasn't been well supported, I think, to do that. So I think we can find synergies between that commercial aspect of marine carbon and the more bigger societal governmental funded things. So, so I think we need to build a system that has some rigidity in it so we can you know, develop the time series that we need to understand the ocean at the same time be agile enough to to take up new technology in both observations and data interpretation thank you thank you tost uh dan we'll let you wrap up this question sure i guess i'm thinking about this issue in terms of both the technology push and the market pull right to go to business basics and i'm not sure i have a good answer for the uh market pull i mean i think that's largely going to be how you know regional, global, local ocean observing systems incentivize uh, you know the adoption of of data from private industry. Um, but as far as the the technology push, I, I want to emphasize something that Gabrielle brought up earlier that I I really liked, uh, and that's kind of baking in these impact um, metrics into government or philanthropic funding for the develop development of new ocean observing technologies. So. For example, you know, at RPE, uh, we have a high risk tolerance, and you know, we have we have teams uh, focusing on pretty out there concepts like nuclear fusion, which you may have been reading about recently. Um, but even though we're we're funding these very early concepts, very risky technologies, we require in our contracts that our teams come up with a business plan in the first quarter of their of their project. So even though their technology readiness levels are very low, from the beginning, they need to be thinking about their technology to market plan. And those are baked in, in into the projects. And not only you know, do we require that from the team, but uh, we, we also provide the guidance and, and the coaching 
uh, within our agency to help them along that path. So, you know, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that funding has impact, um, you know, looking at uh, metrics that can prove that impact from the beginning is, is really important. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks, everyone. So I'd like to draw this session to a close and take a five minute break. Um, after the break, we'll invite all of our audience participants. We'll have about 150 people in total into the conversation uh, for the rest of the session up until about half after the hour. Um, so over the next few minutes, we'll transition everybody into the main room and I'll see you all in five minutes. Hey there. Hello. 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 Yes. Hey, folks, we're taking a short break. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Hello. Hello. Hello, all. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello. We can. We can listen. Uh huh. <clears throat> Doctor Das, how are you? I find. I think. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> nice, actually. Long time. Uh, today is cold, actually. <laughs> nice to meet you after a long time. Oh, really? Uh, it is really so cold in northern uh, part of India, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. Then Calcutta is also there is cold, actually. There are some western disturbances. <clears throat> there are possibilities. Mm -hmm. So there will be rain in the northern parts of India. And now some another spell, there will be winter spell in, <clears throat> in Calcutta and West Bengal also for, for this week, actually. <laughs> Already after 15th, actually, <clears throat> the cold moves away. The temperature becomes higher after the Shangranti. <clears throat> okay. So it's uh, actually compared to other days, actually, there's, uh, there's much colder, actually, mainly from 10th December to <clears throat> last week of January. That is the maximum cold spell. And January is the coldest month, actually, here in the Calcutta. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Compared to North India, it is nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's how the is, issue. How is, how, but, how, is every, how is everything going at your end? Fine, I think. So, uh, actually, Noam, I think Noam has. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I follow the Facebook the page. They were conducted a lot of international conferences recently. I also follow the Facebook page actually. <clears throat> Few oh, of okay, right. to go India. They also started. participated. Yeah. Uh, welcome back, everyone.
Uh, thanks for the robust discussion in both the main dialogue and in the online chat and the Q&A. Uh, so this session is now open for anyone to ask questions or to raise a point. Uh, please, everybody, mute your microphone uh, for the moment. <laughs> after not talking. And please use the raise hand feature, and I'll try to call on you in the order I see hands. So recognizing, though, that these dialogues are aimed at uncovering targeted recommendations, I'd like to kick us off with one pointed question for everyone. What discrete recommendations have we not yet discussed that would help to accelerate the creation, adoption, and deployment of new ocean observing technologies? Uh, you're welcome to go first, and then Matthew. <coughs> All right, Matthew, do you want to go ahead? I, I guess we've alluded to it, but I don't think we've actually proposed it, is, is a mechanism for some transnational capacity <laughs> development in the area. Uh, and that could be a collective demonstration exercise or a uh, targeted around a specific use case. Thanks, Matthew. Any other focus recommendations that anybody wanted to raise? And if not, we can, oh, Toast, go ahead. I think one thing we haven't touched on is probably the need of a bit more efficient and, and better quality control and quality assurance, particularly when we get into large data streams and, and new sensors technology, something that we are not particularly good at at this stage. And it is really needed together with the metadata that Joanna was, was talking about. Um, so I would go for quality control, quality assurance in a more efficient and better way. Thanks. Thank you. Frank, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe the one thing that I, I think we haven't really completely talked about is how do we do this? How do we have a change in culture? And how do we align everything that we're doing to, to, to meet these goals? I, I think that would be very important. We also haven't talked a lot about uh, ocean policy requirements that drive governments and laws to, to say what we can measure where and, and what other requirements that may drive ocean observing. I think that that, uh, that takes a whole community to, to bring together. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Taha, do you have your hand up? Yeah, yes. I, I want to concentrate actually about the plastic, the plastic pollution in the oceans and the uh, uh, also, we need to enhance in the awareness among individuals uh, through updated information uh, or the data about the, um, the world's oceans and how to keep the biodiversity and can, how we can, uh, this biodiversity can be protected in this vital part of the planet. Thank you. Uh, let's go with David Kettle and then Anthony. Yeah, hi. I guess um, my recommendation would be having a look at um, who we're inviting to the table and how we're doing that and opening that door a little wider. Um, as an SME um, innovating in the marine space, particularly marine visual surveys, um, I've, I've been really surprised at how challenging it is even, even to have a conversation with anybody in the space, let alone look, you know, looking at partnerships and things like this. Um, everyone's got their own little bucket of funding and it seems very, very um, tight, tight circled. If you're not part of a big research institution or you know, an existing major player, it's very, very difficult to even have those conversations in the first place. Um, and, and I'll give an example. We, we've just developed a, a brand new technology capable of uh, visual surveys in um, the most rugged coral reef marine systems in the world. Um, we have the logistics of being able to take the current long-term monitoring program here in Australia from one football field captured every year to a million football fields at probably about half or, or three quarters of the current budget. And we can't even have that conversation with anyone. 
Thanks, David. Uh, let's go with Anthony and then Pierre. Yeah, I really appreciate it in the background uh, white paper, the emphasis on engaging commercial partners and developing the new blue economy, moving away from uh, such a heavy dependence on, on government funding and academic research in this space. I think we haven't talked too much about this today, but as a, a corporate representative, I'm particularly interested in this area. And I think there's a couple that are particularly uh, aligned with at least our own work uh, that I'd love to hear more about in, in future meetings and more engagement with, which are our aquaculture and um, environmental monitoring, essentially for regulatory compliance. And these are things that companies will have to face. Uh, and when they we build an offshore wind farm or some other component, there, there should be an environmental, environmental monitoring requirement that's ongoing there. There's assessments. Um, and companies are going to be responsible for this, and they'll see it as a compliance problem. How can they do this? At cost? And that's going to drive a lot of market potentially in these sensors. But how can they meet these environmental regulations uh, without expending uh, much funding? Right? It's, it's not great to be in the compliance business because uh, you're always trying to minimize costs. But but in general, I think that will create a significant uh, market. It is already there in certain areas, but. I'd love to hear more from these experts about how how they think industry, what are going to be the main industry needs in these areas? Where are those investments going to come and how can this community align with those investments? Thanks, Anthony. Uh, let's go with Pierre and then Catherine Houghton and then Jodica. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you, everyone. Very nice. I'm Pierre. I'm with Kongsberg Maritime. Uh, the comment just made about uh, involving the private sector is is, is fantastic, and it was mentioned uh, especially by the colleague from RPAE uh, about how we can bring closer industrial uh, requirements or standards into scientific work. All good. That was not my major comment. You asked for what should be emphasized more or what wasn't mentioned explicitly. I think we heard a lot about the demand and need for improving ocean literacy, about advertising the sector more, about training the workforce, about getting the people from finance, business, banking, insurance, and all the others a little bit up to speed with respect to uh, the human ocean nexus. And I think the connection we have not made, or it was not mentioned as explicitly, is that with the decade we currently have at the moment, we have one of the strongest tools to actually advertise that and make that public. I mean, this is a UN-driven uh, aspect that generates attention throughout all uh, countries and, and, and basically different fields and markets, et cetera, et cetera. So if not getting the attention of these uh, groups that I've just mentioned through something like the decade, I don't know how else we should be able to do that. So maybe that could be channeled into dedicated initiatives in order to truly uh, get this intent attention. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, Catherine and then Jodica. Thank you. Um, this, my name is Catherine Houghton, and I am at Analog Devices, where I run our Ocean and Climate Innovation Accelerator in partnership with Woods Hole Oceanographic. And I just want to build a little bit on what Anthony and Pierre just mentioned is that many of you may not have heard of us, but we're a uh, $12 billion sensor electronics manufacturer. We're in all your phones, your electric vehicles, in your televisions, we're everywhere. And we have um, stepped into this space about a year and a half ago to understand how our technology and our knowledge could really support collecting ocean data at scale. And we're finding that our skill set is now starting to be very recognized that our ability and the high tech industry's ability to create standard as a de facto practice to create low cost sensors that we can manufacture at scale, how to look about creating things into platforms so not every not everything's a onesie twosie kind of development. Um, and as we're finding, as we're stepping into this place, not only are we giving the financial support to the ocean space as we're doing this, but also dealing with supply chain so that, you know, the scientists are getting the parts they need rapidly. But it's also really impacting our employees as they're getting involved, speaking about getting interest in that ocean space so that they're excited to use their engineering capabilities and their knowledge of low power and edge computing to help support things like ocean exploration. So 
Um, obviously, my purpose is really to talk about building stronger um, relationships with high tech industry, be it the Googles or the analog devices, or the computing companies, because and it's not you don't have to ne necessarily then worrying about losing employees It's about building that knowledge of ocean and the exciting challenges and the complexity of working in the ocean gets the companies extremely excited and it's a great learning opportunity for them. And like I said, our employees are excited to use their high tech skills to help solve a problem that they're very aware is urgent. Um, but understanding um, the ocean space is valuable, but also it's helping to connect with the ocean scientists who may not be as on touch as like all the massive innovation that's happening in the high tech world on AI, ML, computing, edge computing, communications that would really disrupt and accelerate the work that's being done in the ocean. So that's. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Jodica and then Tom. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, so one thing I don't think we really touched on is crowdsourcing ocean observation data. And uh, that ties into making sensors really easy to use. It was slightly touched on earlier, but uh, I'm thinking of something like in the near shore environment, the smart fin sensor that surfers can just plug and play on their surfboards, collecting temperature or other measurements. Uh, and something that's so easy to use that they actually don't need to plug it in to download their data. They just put it on top of their phone device, their mobile device. Um, so looking at examples on land, we have purple air for air quality. It's really, truly crowdsourcing a lot of sensor data to provide something that is a meaningful observation or uh, Google Maps and ways for um, navigation for, you know, using car GPS. So I think we have so many sensors out there um, for things like that. But if we can make the sensors in the ocean super easy to use, and collect data, obs ocean observation data in that very near shore uh, and crowdsource it. I mean, the ocean race is another example. It's about to start next week, global race. They're going to be collecting scientific and ocean observation data as they go as well. Uh, and how do we ingest that? Thanks, Jodica. Uh, Tom and then Jeff. Thanks, Chris. I think uh, getting back to that that question about um, who does what, uh, my thoughts were that the United Nations have to be the starting point, really. And if that doesn't work, is there a way that we can build or support a multinational ocean enterprise, maybe a working group that envisions common necessities? And really, each nation has to identify, one, their societal needs, two, their economic needs, and then three, their reliance on the ocean or their blue economic ch uh, channels that support those economic needs. And then at that point, the UN can help identify the ocean science needs and our ocean observing requirements, while at the same time, um, really consolidating all of the science that we do into what we truly need. And uh, along that, we really need to look also at educating those nations to get up to par. I mean, we it's great that we are building plug and play systems and, and uh, seabed mounted systems and crowdsourcing data, but a lot of these nations in the UN don't understand or have the capacity right now to do that. So without educating them from the ground up, we, we're going to kind of uh, hit some roadblocks. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Jeff, and then Ian, and then Chris and Colleen. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Douglas. I'm um, CEO and co-founder of a company called Mythos AI. We're a marine autonomy company. I think the biggest thing for moving this space forward is to have a serious conversation about how much funding technology and operations in this space really take. Um, you know, just running vessels can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And when you see 
some of these government initiatives to fund tech commercially, they're for just a couple hundred thousand dollars or even incubators and um, blue tech investors are just really offering small amounts of money to try to get these technologies off. And what I think you're seeing in the space is the real companies that are commercializing and helping the industry move the quickest are the ones going out and raising venture capital. They're going to Silicon Valley. Um, they're hardening their tech and then they're presenting them to this industry. Uh, it's more efficient to do it that way than to bootstrap through kind of going after um, research grants and things like that. But there is an issue where Silicon Valley knows more about going to space than they do about the marine domain, about the opportunities. And I actually think this is a huge opportunity for this community to help push the industry forward faster. The first thing a company, a first questions a company gets when they go to raise money is, you know, who believes in you? What are you doing? Uh, is this a real opportunity? They try to research and and in the blue industry, blue economy, uh, it's you really have to be in the network of networks, which I think something a couple other people mentioned. Um, and honestly, I, I just think this industry needs more capital than than we're getting right now. So that's I just wanted to bring that up as what I foresee is a really good opportunity to help move this industry forward more quickly. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Ian, and then Chris. Hi. Um... To follow up on what other people were saying about the opportunities of offshore wind, this is completely true. It's already happening here in Europe that uh, I know of a small company that uh, had 20 employees doing measurements for offshore wind companies that now has over 200 um, using small uh, surface drones. And they they gave up trying to look at the public sector for for contracts, but uh, the private sector is much more accommodating. We're also, um, the, the other point that maybe I'd like to make is the difficulty of convincing policymakers of the importance of ocean observations and the need to really spell it out in detail. Because to everybody in this call, it's, it's obvious. You know, you don't really need, you're, you're trying to increase it and the need for it is obvious, but it's not, it's not obvious for them. It's, it's not obvious. And then, for instance, if we tried to do an impact assessment for reducing single use plastics, they say, where's the data on the, on the plastics in the ocean? And, the, uh, and you have to make some really wild assumptions to actually pass the, our regulatory scrutiny board. I'm with the European Commission, by the way. Thank you, Ian. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Chris and Colleen and then Glenn. You know, I think we've uh, we've certainly touched on uh, a need to articulate the value proposition, be it for socio, you know, economic benefit or due to some kind of requirement coming down, top down, regulatory, what have you. Uh, we've talked about the technology that might be required to, to fill that need and so forth. But I don't think we've really touched on is the means of data visualization. And so ultimately, all this very complex information, very disparate types of data, different types of sensing modalities has to be integrated somehow and presented to decision makers and to the general public. And I think a great you know, an analogy would be the weather system. If you think about the plethora of sensing systems that are out there gathering information, the computing, the model predictions that are used, but to the user, it's quite intuitive and very simple. We don't have anything like that for describing ocean biology, for example. Environmental DNA is often touted as something equivalent to what satellite sensing is to observing ocean or surface in enormous scale. But we have no way to visualize that data that is really interpretable for the general public or a resource manager. So I think that how we present this information ultimately is one of the challenges that we face, and we haven't really solved that problem just yet. Thanks. Yeah, good point, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Colleen, and then Glenn, and then Kent. 
Uh, thank you, Chris. So to dovetail into what Tom said, I, I agree with uh, that's what I was trying to mention before is like lifting this task force up higher, right? Going to the UN and how do we divide that up into, you know, tech transfer, um, standards and regulations and requirements, funding and investment, sort of breaking it up easy so it can be easily digested to influencers and policymakers. And then I'd like to add another thing about the tech transfer piece is that we're about to launch an open source visualization tool that came out of a DARPA project. So there's a great showing, there are examples out there of how some of the funding through government is going to get the data into the right hands of scientists and researchers and vice versa. So looking at that two-way street and including that in our message into the UN and into these larger policy programs, I think is super important. And then one last comment. In 2009, um, I think some of you were there, I got into a little bit of trouble about talking about branding the ocean um, and the blue economy. Uh, that's my marketing hat occasionally. And I think when we as researchers, scientists, and even industry go into these larger stories and, and, and programs with like the UN, we need to be clear and concise about what we're asking and the impact and value that we're delivering to those to those end users. Yeah, good points, Colleen. Thank you. Uh, Glenn, and then Kent, and then Frank. Okay, um, Glenn Anderson, I'm the board chair of k for Ocean Labs in Wilmington, North Carolina. And in a previous life, I spent 12 years in the Washington State Legislature dealing with uh, education and workforce issues in particular. But as, a, as part of that, you have to be a politician. And when I mean, I'm listening through, you know, we have a lot of threads that come through ocean technologies will come in a lot of threads that go out. Um, there are a lot of different audiences and everybody's looking for the one audience that can sort of influence all the other audiences. And that's just not gonna happen. So the, the real challenge and actually following on to the last conversation, there needs to be a brand, a brand that is public facing what we do at Cape Fear Ocean Lab, so people can sort of get their heads around it. We, we're looking at uh, putting together an advanced prototyping you know, facility, and we just call it, we're a toolbox. You know, something simple, people get the idea. But finding a way to identify the, the particular audiences beyond just funding, obviously that's important, but um, the thing that moves funding on uh, something very technical like this is the fact that people back home, when a lobbyist or an interested party, an advocate goes in and says, this is the best thing since sliced bread, it's necessary, um, it's good people, and here are the outcomes, here's the data. The first thing most of those people who are in the position to authorize that funding do is call somebody at home. And sit there and say, is anybody doing this? Why, why should we do this? Is this a good idea? Um, so figuring out the, uh, the real audiences of blue technology, um, it really is a, a critical step. That, that's a research project in its own. And then developing the brand as being the tool makers for climate change response or for one audience or it's the next great thing for the funding audience. Um, you can make blue tech engineering sexier than solving the problem. And unfortunately, sometimes that's the way you do it. Sometimes it rubs against the skin, but um, developing that brand for blue ocean technologies as a toolbox um, something in that vein has to happen. The second thing, um, and this goes to the fact when you go to VCs and private equity and those kind of folks, they don't know what to look for in um, all the literature. Um, there's an amazing amount of information that's actually out there on blue technology, blue economy issues. They're not linked. There's no common repository uh, for blue tech, ocean technology information. 
And so when we go out, we could sit there and say, okay, here's 20 links that'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, and absolutely none of them will get looked at. The question is, is one space where a VC or an investment analyst can say, this is the blue library. And that may be a project where maybe it's going to Google or you know, a federal agency funding is that help is a match to start. But having that centralized repository across the blue silos um, would be a huge help because whether it's legislative staff, congressional staff, or those investment analysts, there's a defined, credible repository that they can go surf, surf through as opposed to a hundred different sites where they can get nits and pieces and they get tired of looking at trying to find what they're looking for. So yeah. that's my 10 cents. Thanks, Glenn. I appreciate that. All right, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, let's try and get Kent and Frank and Bruce and Dan. Hey, Chris, can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> My name is Kent Satterley, and I'm the executive director of the Gulf Offshore Research Institute. We call it GORI. And uh, we're conducting research on uh, repurposing the offshore platforms in the Gulf of Mexico once they've ceased uh, oil and gas production. As many of you know, there, there are uh, very many of those platforms offshore that have um, contributed to the economy of the Gulf Coast for, for many, many years, and, uh, and also to the ecosystem, uh, to the marine economy. And uh, we'd like to see those platforms remain as long as possible because they continue to contribute to the ecosystem. But in the research that we've conducted, we see uh, tremendous opportunity for uh, other profit, uh, profitable businesses uh, conducted from those platforms in addition to marine monitoring activities, which uh, they're excellent for. Uh, but we, we've started a, a spinoff company uh, based on the research uh, by the name of Blue Silo uh, Aquaculture. And uh, we plan to do marine offshore aquaculture adjacent to one of the platforms that we're currently uh, permitting for alternate use. And uh, we plan to use uh, uh, as much AI, as much uh, robotic activity as possible uh, to minimize the amount of, uh, of human labor needed off on, on those offshore platforms. Obviously, they, uh, there will, be, will need to be some, uh, and uh, we'll have communications with the beach and uh, satellite communications, et cetera. But uh, there are many opportunities there uh, as, uh, as, as a demonstration platform uh, to conduct uh, AI experiments as we begin to uh, conduct uh, the fish farming and uh, and other operations on the platform. Excellent, thanks, Ken. Uh, Frank, go ahead. Uh, briefly, want to go back to something that Tom was saying, and and also Chris Scolin brought up, and that is uh, international organizations and and how we use national governments to put pressure and organize the house that we have here. One thing that the weather prediction people have done very well through the World Meteorological Organization and World Weather Watch is they've organized themselves for 100 years around standards and conventions that different meteorological agencies around the world follow. It doesn't matter what brand instrument you have, they all have to be integrated into a GTS and pass the data through. So we don't have anything like that for oceanography, but we do have the organization. So we don't need new organizations. We have a, uh, an intergovernmental oceanographic commission. We have a global ocean observing system. We have a group on earth observations and you can go down the list. But what we need is a mandate from, for example, the Convention on Biological Diversity or the UNFCCC or national governments to push the member states of the IOC to tell Goose, go organize this and then fund the local and national entities to, to do this. So, so that mandate and those conventions don't exist for oceanography and we need them in order to have standards and, and produce data in a way that is useful for forecasting life and forecasting the ocean. Thanks, Frank. 
Uh, Bruce. And... So I got to speak. Yeah, Bruce, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to uh, just present two examples that perhaps could be emulated uh, in the broader community. And this stems from my work with, with smart cables. Uh, for those that you don't know this uh, initiative, it's basically piggybacking on the uh, global submarine telecommunications network by adding sensors to those cables, environmental sensors, um, and, and basically providing power and internet on the seafloor and uh, with 25 year life and that whole industry behind it. Um, and the first system will be installed in Portugal, uh, Portugal, Azores, Madeira in the next years. Uh, so there are two examples I wanna mention. One is um, we're accessing different communities to support our efforts. Um, and, and one example is the European Commission has an RFP on the street for 100 million euros for international submarine cable connectivity. And they will, uh, as part of that funding, support environmental sensing in, in cable systems. So we're, we're accessing funding from a, let's say a more wealthy community to support our efforts. Uh, so, you know, if the European Commission can do that, European Union, then perhaps other countries can be persuaded to do something similar. Uh, the second one, standards have been mentioned. So one of our sponsors is the International Telecommunications Union, a UN agency, and they have a study group set up now to establish standards for smart cables. So they, they issue standards for 5G, for ethernet, for internet, all that kind of thing. So it's, it's reaching out beyond our community to um, leverage these other uh, possibilities that I'm, I'm suggesting we perhaps need to do more of. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. All right, we've got time for a few more folks. So let's go with Dan and Raja and Ken, and then I think we'll wrap it up. Thanks, Chris, and uh, just thanks again for the opportunity to be here uh, in, with, with this group. Um, so I, I just want to end by emphasizing uh, that my belief that the ocean observing community should closely coordinate with the emerging marine carbon dioxide removal industry. And I know uh, there's some folks here from Carbon Plan and from Ocean Visions, and I'm sure they're also thinking uh, similar things that I am. But, uh, you know, it, it's now thought that marine CDR is going to play a critical role in addressing our climate crisis and uh, staying within our one and a half degree warming pathways um, uh, in our international goal frameworks. And so this is going to be an enormous growing industry this coming decade, potentially. Uh, it, the market, the MCDR market could, could be in the hundreds of billions of dollars by 2050. Um, and the monitoring and sensing and validation of marine CDR, uh, the challenges there in terms of the, the spatial and volumetric and temporal scales of sensing and modeling are directly analogous to those challenges seen in ocean observing. And right now, carbon registries and other carbon market folks are developing the guidance protocols for the sensing and measurement of marine CDR projects. And those protocols are going to drive the data collection that and the information that is collected in these marine CDR projects. So now is the time to get involved and help drive you know, ocean observing priorities in the development of these new uh, protocols in an, in an emerging, emerging industry. So. Um, these conversations are happening now. This industry has the potential to, go, to grow very quickly, very soon. And so I, I would again urge that uh, ocean, ocean observing uh, regional associations and national associations um, coordinate with this industry. Thank you, Dan. All right, Raja and Ken, and then I'll ask Donna to come back on and, and close it out for us. Uh, 
uh, good evening, good morning, and uh, uh, thanks everybody for uh, sir, for inviting to this wonderful discussion meeting. So I uh, I, I would like to emphasize that actually, and uh, nowadays actually at present the present technology permits us to have several observing systems such as the buoys uh, for ocean observation, and there is a tsunami buoys for recording the seismic observations, and there are other marine meteorological systems. But uh, in future we expect from the industry leaders to impose some hybrid system so that actually it can uh, cover all the uh, recording all the seismic observation um, oceanic and marine meteorological uh, observations uh, simultaneously in the one system instead of going in and that will be much economical and would help the research organizations to have a long range of data and especially in the uh, field of disaster management uh, second thing is the uh, ocean energy, uh, because these are very uh, prospective field of ocean energy. Because actually nowadays fossil fuel is slowly decreasing and ocean energy is clean energy. And in the deep sea observations, where we have to put much of the systems, they can be relying on the huge amount of ocean energy, which can uh, simultaneously help to sustain our systems. And thirdly, sir, in the Southern Ocean, where we have scarcity of data because there is no uh, there is much less observing systems and we have to wholly depend on the satellite data, sir. So <clears throat> there actually the drifters and the cell drones can play a greater role. And that technology, I think, is a promising technology of the future and uh, people uh, great with the new technology for the ocean to get. Thank, thank you, sir, go, for giving me this opportunity. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And Penn, you're welcome to talk. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Uh, you're good. There you are. And my camera is off. Apologies. Uh, my name's uh, Ken Costell. I'm the Director of Research Communications at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, thanks everybody who preceded me in the long list of people who who made comments. I'd like to roll the co the conversation back a little bit to to talk about uh, reaching out to broader audiences and defining those audiences, uh, and suggest that you know we take a page from NASA in some respects. And apologies if some of this has already been covered. Um, we you know we really need to focus on relevance of our work um, about of uh, in ocean science. Uh, the relevance of knowledge of the ocean and in general relevance of, of the ocean to everyone on the planet at all times and we need to broaden that relevance you know well beyond coastal uh, regions and show how the blue economy is just simply the economy you know i'm i'm from indiana i i live on cape cod now but when i go home i often get blank looks when i tell people what i do and what i work on and it even among those friends of mine who stayed behind uh, to farm. And I have to remind them, you know, that the water that falls on your crops came from the ocean at some point and that ignorance about the ocean is expensive. You know, improving our knowledge of, you know, using obser uh, observing systems like Raja just talked about before me, lowers the cost of cost of, of crop insurance, which lowers the price of food and that is something that everybody understands right now is is an important part of their daily lives so you know i think the more that we can talk about relevance and you know just the the day-to-day -day importance about improving our 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 knowledge of the ocean and improving our uh the lot of life of, of everybody on the planet is ultimately going to be what makes or breaks the uh, the relevance of the the decade? Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Yeah, thank you, Ken. That's a that's a great point to wrap up on. I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I just want to thank everybody who's here for a fantastic conversation and your engagement today. Um, I've had a ton of fun. I've learned a lot, and it's been a pleasure to chat with you. Um, I invite Donna to come back on to discuss next steps in our dialogue, um, but also to close today's conversation. So Donna, over to you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chris, um, for your excellent moderation. And it brought together such a great conversation on all these new technologies and emerging ocean information um, that I that I can tell are going to uh, change over the next decade and change how we do business in the future. Um, thank you uh, to all the participants. It was a wonderful conversation. I think we got a lot of good information out of it. Um, these dialogues take a team. And I wanna thank my colleagues listed here on this last slide uh, for all the work that went into the organizing these uh, dialogue series. Um, as next steps, we're gonna summarize uh, the 
conversation from this dialogue and synth synthesize this with um, our prior three dialogues uh, to produce something actionable. Um, we're also working uh, with outside entities to see if there's a, to evaluate the need for future topics to see where we can take this. We've got some ideas uh, listed by the panel here. We're, we've collected the demonstration opportunities um, and we'll see uh, getting you know the epochs involved, more involved. Um, but once this work is completed, we look forward to sharing our results with you and uh, we'll see where we go from there. But um, let's carry on this conversation and, and keep in touch. And uh, we thank you again very much for your participation. Have a, have a wonderful day and a happy new Thanks, year. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.